Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School this morning again. It's an op we have the opportunity to sit be before God and learn again this morning. So can we just bow down our heads and pray as we go on? Brother, I will bless you. Hi, Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come before you, Lord. Father, Lord God, we pray, O oh Lord God, that Father, as we look into your word, we pray that, Father, your spirit will have preeminence in the name of Jesus. We pray that, Father, Lord God, every heart will receive this word in the name of Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord God, that whatever it is that makes men not to receive your word, we pray that the Holy Spirit will repair in the name of Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord God, that, Father, we will be doers of this word, not just hearers in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus that, Father, Lord God, these words will not stand against us in judgment in the name of Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord God, that, Father, Lord God, as we go, we pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to through us and to all of us in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, sir. <coughs> so we will, before we go on to today's study, which is infant Christians, that's the topic for today, but we'll just go to do a recap of last week's study. Just a quick recap. Brother Tyron, can you do the honors, please? Praise the Lord. Yes, yeah, so last week we looked at um, relentless soul winning, and um, the idea we were trying to convey last week mostly was that um, soul winning was both to unbelievers, people out there, and also to your own brethren, you know, your brothers and sisters in Christ, where we look out for one another and encourage one another, even unto righteousness. Praise the Lord. And then we, we also looked at that, we said that soul winning was the heartbeat of God, that if there's anything that God is most interested in is that all souls, all men, all women, we come to the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Bible says, I have no pleasure that anyone um, perishes. So that, that was his great, um, that, that was his heartbeat. And then we took an example of when he spoke to Ezekiel and he admonished him that when I tell you to go warn people about um, judgment and sin, he says, if you don't ask them, I'm going to, you are going to give an account as to what, if any, if they end up perishing. So it became um, imperative that for each and every one of us, we should take the gospel of soul winning, the gospel of reaching out to souls and encouraging them and talking to them about Jesus, very, very important because each and every one of us, we give our accounts to that work and commandment that Jesus um, gave to us. And then I think finally we also look at the tools for soul winning. You know, it tells you that before you can go win a soul, you yourself must be born again. You know, a blind person cannot lead another um, blind person. So it tells you that that's one thing we have to know. Um, another thing, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. As a believer, you have the, the Holy Spirit inside of you. It, it, so it becomes, it's you that you have to work with the Holy Spirit, you know, for inspiration, for teaching. Another thing again is that you have to have compassion. You can, you're not going out to judge, you are going out with a compassionate heart, the same way Jesus had. We should also have a faith that all souls can be won. It doesn't make sense um, going out, you know, going to preach, and while we are preaching in our mind, we are seeing that person in hell already. We should have faith that God can save even to the very utmost. Another thing is that we should have zeal to win all souls, and we must have prayer. You must be prayerful. Praise the Lord. This thing will require God's hand in prayer, in our evangelism um, work. We also need wisdom to respond to issues. And wisdom most times will come from God and you study in the Bible. We need patience. Sometimes you speak to people right now, they might not give their life to Christ. But he that has begun a good work, we bring it to pass. And then finally, holy living. Our lifestyle should reflect what we say with our mouth. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. God bless you. I wanted to just share, I don't know whether I would call it testimony of, you know, making sure that we preach to whoever God brings our way. Because let's say you are on your way to destruction and someone knows that, okay, ahead is a big pit that, and that person had driven past that place and they don't tell you. How would you feel? If you eventually now fall into that pit, will that person go scot-free? Um, I remember years and years ago when 
we used to take this big bus in Nigeria. We call it Molo, right? There's a lot of people inside. And <clears throat> this brother just got up. I felt, even as a Christian, that I should preach, but to get up in a mall where I preach <laughs> was a great task. So, but you know, I believe that every child of God in that bus felt that prompting of the Spirit. But this brother came up and started preaching right from where we were, and he was so passionate about it. And at some point, um, this man, these two people gave their lives to Christ. And he, he led them in the sinner's prayer and all that. And they got saved. They got down at a particular bus stop. One of them, Jay, Jay walked and ran across the, the express road and instantly was hit by a car. And the guy died. So goose pimples, of, of course, everybody was so... <laughs> so this brother just got up and said, you know, that man that just gave his life to Christ and died because he was going to die is, is, is in heaven now, I'm sure. But what about all of you? From the driver <laughs> to everybody, everybody just gave... It was my salvation that they had never seen that kind of thing. But... The rest of us just kept quiet. We didn't because it was it was really daunting, daunting to us to get up in that. But God knew that those souls were not going to. They don't have much time left. So you never know whoever you come across whether they had time left. And that is why we need to passionately, you know, you know, just make sure we go after them with everything that is in us. And I believe that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So when but the Bible says that if you refuse to say it, thank God that brother saved the rest of us. <laughs> because you refuse to say it, and that person, you know, you just, just, you know, and we thank God. Let me not just redo the whole thing. So I just want to encourage us to make soul winning a priority. That is the only thing that has record in heaven. Praise the Lord. The Bible says that when a soul is born again, there is rejoicing in heaven. Even a child might be born into the world. Yeah, the Bible didn't say there will be rejoicing. If you get a promotion, the Bible did not say. But the one thing that brings joy to heaven, to God's heart, is when someone actually gives their life to Christ. And I pray that the Lord will use us the more, even in this endeavor in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. So today, the topic is infant Christians, infant Christians, and we're going to, and before we go on, I just want to let us know that this is not an exercise in determining <laughs> who else is, who, who is out there that is an infant Christian, you know, trying to decipher whether this person is, this message is for you. This message is for me. So let's let's take it like that. Whatever we see from the scriptures and we know that our lives are not aligning with those things, then we know that whatever God says, you know, the Jew might say you are a mature Christian. But if the Bible says you are not, then you are not. And we need to make adjustment right away. That's the reason why God tells us these things over and over again so that our lives can, you know, reflect what he wants us to be. Praise the Lord. So I want also want us to I want to encourage participation, please. Ask your questions, your comment. We're really looking forward to hearing from you. Praise the Lord. So our our lesson text for today will be First Corinthians chapter three from verses one to four. But I think I want to add to that. Let's just put um first Corinthians, let's start from verse Chapter 2, chapter 2 from verse 12, and then we'll read to 3, verse 4. So 1 Corinthians 2, 12, to 1 Corinthians 3, 4. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. So 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, it says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, 
not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth, judgeth all things, yet he is not judged of no man. For who had known the mind of, of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I, brethren, so I mean, I'm in chapter 3 now. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For if at all you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are ye not carnal, and walk as men. For while one said, I am of Paul, and another, I am of, of Apollos, are ye not, not carnal? Yeah. Praise, Praise God. God. Thank you, sir. Um, so we've read the scripture, but our memory verse, before we go back to that, our memory verse is First um, Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. Those who have done believers class should know that. <laughs> Praise God. First Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Can we take it together? One, two, go. As, As newborn new babes, babes desire the sincere milk, milk of the word, word that, that you may, may grow thereby. thereby. Can we take it one more time? As, As newborn babes, babes desire, desire the sincere milk, milk of the word that you may, may grow thereby. First Peter 2.2. Two. Two. Praise the Lord. I'll read the introduction and then we'll go back to the scriptures. We're not going to be in a hurry because we believe this is a you know, very important topic for us as Christians. And um, we want to be able to make sure that um, what God wants to pass across will pass everything across. So we're not going to let time constrain us. Praise God. So if we don't finish today, that means we'll finish up next week. Lesson introduction says, whenever a child is born, Growth is necessary. First Samuel two twenty six. Can we read that? First Samuel two twenty six. Mm -hmm. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. Amen. So the Bible records that Samuel grew in stature from that that um, scripture. It was also recorded concerning John the Baptist that he grew. Luke one eighty. Yeah, Luke one. Verse 80 says, And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. Amen. So we'll read Luke chapter 2, verse 40 and verse 52. So verse 40 and 52. Luke 2, 40. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And verse 52. It says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Amen. Praise God. That was talking about Jesus. And the common thing about all these people that the Bible um, spoke about, that Samuel, John, and Jesus, was that they grew. There was growth involved. So, however, growth is oft, often neg neglected spiritually. Paul wrote on the spiritual growth of the Corinthians. And this was like years after they've been saved. <laughs> after he had labored among them, he wrote to them. And because he heard what was happening, you know, among them. So he wrote this letter to them and said, you know, you, you can't continue like this. And I'm praying that as many of us that, uh, you know, in the same, you know, boat with the Corinthians, which could be all of us, <laughs> or most of us, or a few of us, it, it doesn't matter, but let the Holy Spirit just minister to you that by, by His grace, we will shift camp from where we are to where God wants us to be in Jesus' name. So there are carnal Christians, which means that they profess Christ, they say they are born again, but um, they still are carnal. So carnal means flesh. Though they were flesh, but they were living according to the flesh, and they show traits of 
being babies in Christ. Praise God. Does any one of us want to say anything to that introduction and the scripture we just read before we go on? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, when we look at the uh, the Samuel uh, scripture we read and John and Jesus, they grew. And, you know, the Bible said that they work strong in spirit. So that means not only were they growing physically, and it was said of even Jesus that, and in wisdom and in the grace of God, so, and I think Jesus is our, is our template. So, yes, we've read from Samuel, we've read from John the Baptist, but Jesus gives us the complete, the complete growth pattern. There's, he grew, he walked strong in spirit, he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God. So as Christians, we, as, as Christians and like what we've said, there's no problem when you are a baby in Christ, when you are really a baby. But it is when we are supposed to be grown-ups, but now we are now showing uh, signs of, of, of being babes. So as Christians, we should, and, we should and, and I think we should pray for the grace of God because it's the grace of God that makes a lot of things that are hard easy for us to, to, to be able to do. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. You wanted to say something to that? So. Um, yes, praise the Lord. So I think I'm um, looking at the memory verse and also that we started from First Corinthians two. We look at we see that a a carnal Christian is somebody who has accepted the Spirit of God, who has accepted the gift of um, salvation, but not the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and the transformation of the inner man. The Bible says in Hebrews five thirteen it says for for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So like our brother said, you can come, you, most times you, as a Christian, you become, you come into the faith, you know, your initial, you know, one month, you just go in that way. The, the, the belief is that as you keep hearing the word of God, you will continue to mature. At the beginning, they, you are giving milk. Milk is food that is not hard to digest. So most times you have teachers, people who will come and take hard scriptures and break it down to the very level that you can understand as a new Christian. Praise the Lord. The application of the word. But as you keep going on, the belief is that at one point you will begin to, you, you of yourself, will be able to open up the Bible and read the Bible and be able to see God's heart and his thoughts in the scripture and apply it into your life. So if you are carnal, you are somebody, yes, you are saved, but your life is still fleshly. You know, the Bible says that, um, if you look at 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, it says, For I have failed you with meek and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it. A carnal person is someone who can bear heavy scriptures. He can't go into the Bible and understand what God is really saying. It says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, and ye are not carnal. Are ye not carnal? You find out that one of the qualifying things of someone who is a carnal Christian is strife, division. You know, when you start out and when you come into the faith, one of the things you want to do all the time is, you know, I've heard the Bible, the next thing you, you want to argue it to the end. When we define um, strife, strife means an angry, you know, angry or bitter you know, arguing, argument or disagreement over something that is fundamental. So maybe me and someone have a, a disagreement, you know, we are, we are, you say no is yes, I say it's no. But when we, when we have strife and we, are, we quarrel to the point where we are not talking to each other anymore, it is me versus you. The Bible says that that is carnality. And it also says in verse 4, for one seer I am of Paul and another of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Canal, a canal Christian is somebody who follows men and not God. They are followers of men. They come in and rather than say God is a father to all, most times they start with, um, my, if, you are not, if you are not of my local parish, you are not one of us. If you, you know, and it's not only in the church, but even in your workplace. Are you somebody who, when you come into work, you are always having, you have factions. It is us versus them. You know, you start creating group and division. So the Bible says that if we, if we exhibit some of all these things, the Bible says that we are babes, we are carnal, and this is not what is expected of, of a Christian. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. So um, I want to say that spiritual maturity is not 
automatic. Like a child that's drinking milk would grow. There's no way, right? They will usually, if, if they're eating well, they will grow because the body is made to grow in that respect. So if you keep feeding a child, then it will, it will grow well. But spiritually, you can actually be fed, but not grow. Because that's where the spiritual <clears throat> differs from the physical. You know, this, in the spiritual, you have to do something with what you're being fed. You have to actually um, walk the walk. Not just talk to you know, not just talk the talk or or know the scriptures. Uh, spirituality is not just the knowledge. Um, Christians that are not mature is not that they lack um, the word of God, but they lack the the life. The life is not aligning with the word that they know. They 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 are opposites with what they are reading, what they are studying. And it's, so it's not just a, it's not a brain thing. It's not an intellectual thing. It's not a knowledge thing only. It's, it's, a, it's a life that is lived in Christ. You know, Paul says, in him I live. In him I move. In him I have my being. Praise the Lord. That is, that is maturity. So is, is the ability to respond to the word of God the way that God wants us to respond to it. So when you even when you are given the milk, what does it do in your system? What do you allow it? We are we have the the um, ability to determine how that milk affects us. Whether we just it will just go in through one ear and go out through the other, or it would actually work in us to do what God wants to do. Praise the Lord. So we're going to look at the signs of infancy. A brother has mentioned some of them. And this is where we all come in. That you look at if any of these traits is in your life, if it's in my life, then I need to make a change. This is the reason God is speaking to us at this point in time. Praise the Lord. So if anything that we've said, we, we read from the scriptures, if we're seeing those, you know, tendencies in our lives, or we know these are habits that we have, I, I know the word of God comes with grace. Truth comes with grace. When that truth of the word hits you, the grace to actually do that would also be made available. So we just need to accept it and begin to walk the way God wants us to walk. Praise the Lord. So look at, um, so the first thing here from what, are, what we have in the outline, the signs of infancy is um, babes often require attention. You know, children are very reactive. <laughs> Any small thing, they cry. So if you're a whining Christian, <laughs> then you know that, okay, I might be I'm probably a babe in Christ. I've not grown to that. So children want attention. They want um, they, they want something to be done right now. They are reactive. They cry. They are demanding. They don't give. They want to receive all the time. You know, th th those, those are the attributes of children. And when you are really young, when you are really a baby, it's 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 a cute <laughs> attribute. <laughs> Praise God! It's it's a cute one. It's it's nice. But then, if at five year old, you are still doing what a baby six month old should be doing, or at you know certain age at ten years old, you are still in diapers, then we know that there is trouble. You know, you can do a selfie of you know those those your. Um, Instagram thing of your baby in diaper running about your toddler. It's cute, isn't it? But if you do that, a five-year-old <laughs> and is in diapers, the people will know that there is trouble somewhere. Amen. So these are the things that we need to look at. So if we look, if we see these things in our lives, then we know that it's like that picture of a seven-year-old running around in diapers because it's supposed to have gotten out of that stage. Praise the Lord. So, yeah. Yeah, praise, another thing is that children are, as in, they are, 
they are em they are just hundred percent emotional. They don't because you know it, as a parent sometimes you get frustrated and I had to go and read the book and like okay why is it that these children just behave like this and you know and the book said they are hundred percent emotional so don't even think they are logical at any point. Mm -hmm. So and what does emotional mean? It means being fleshly. That means it is how they feel that no. they would act out. Yeah. So if, as a Christian, we must act out what we feel, then I think that's a cue too. Praise, Amen. Praise God. Yes, sir. Yeah. What's that too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that that's so great because a lot, and also, you know, for it's people. It's not who, funny though. Yeah, but for people who have <laughs> children, so yes. Scary. It requires a whole lot of, it's a lot of maintenance. Yeah. You know, you sleep with one eye open, you are, you are, you are cooking, you are, look, you know, you are constantly checking up on them and all that because a child does not understand why you should not play with fire. Mm. He, he doesn't understand. And that's the same characteristic with a, with a carnal Christian. Mm. A carnal Christian does not understand why you should not watch um, illicit content on your phone. Yeah. A, a carnal Christian does not understand. It never says why they should not look at pornographic movies. They never say why you should not lie at work. So as, as a carnal Christian, now you've lived your life long enough. At the beginning, you had people who were your mentors, your, you know, discipled you. They were always checking up on you. Your phone, hope you didn't watch this this week. Hope you were this, hope you were accountable. But five years into the ministry, into hearing that and being led in that regard, you still cannot see why you should not go sleep in your boyfriend's house when you are not married. You, you just don't know that. You, you cannot come to that knowledge of the truth. It's, it, so when you look at that, you find out that you can be, if you are 20 years, five years, and you know, you've heard this word, and the Bible says that in Luke Titus 1, the Bible says they are disobedient. The Bible says they profess that they know God, but in the works, they deny him. God, to you, you might think I'm just there, but the Bible calls it disobedience. So you find out that if, you, if you've been in the, in the faith for quite a long time, you have heard this word, you have been schooled in this thing, and you still cannot discern between good and evil. You still cannot make right choices, and people still have to check up on you. Your mother has to send somebody to come and check, you know, just to keep an eye, CCTV, exactly, just, to, just to monitor you because they don't know what you can do, you know. You find out that you are a carnal Christian. You know, and, and God is letting us know that he's that state, he's not happy with it. Mm -hmm. He's putting so much effort into your life. He brings teachers. He raises up people all around to build you up. And if after 10 years, your parents have been taking care of you, feeding you, and at the end, you are still, you still, <laughs> you are still putting on pampers. You know, you know what the, the feeling that they would get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. That's awesome. Amen. So First Peter two one, let's read First Peter two one. If you are there, you can read. Yeah, First, First Peter two one says, "Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile, and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings." Okay, so the 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 things that the Bible pointed out there of one some of the characteristics of carnal Christians, and um, like I said, do you, you know what you might have done this. Or you might be doing this. You might and sometimes if you know that okay, I've moved past that seat, but I now find myself doing it again, then you know that you are reverting to you're not moving forward at that point. So we need to just quickly leave that stage and move forward to something better. Praise the Lord. So the Bible talks here about malice. <laughs> Some people are specialists in my you know, I'll just I'm not going to talk to them. And the thing about malice is not just not speaking to another person. It's having some form of evil intention. If you hear something good is happening to them, would you be happy? If you hear that something you know great is happening in their lives, are you really excited for them like we should? So that is malice. You don't, someone we have malice with, we don't really want it to be well with them. If something bad happens, you say, yeah, you know, you might not say it out, but you say, yeah, it deserves it or whatever. So um, hypocrisy. Um, Christians that are carnal, carnal, they are hypocrites. They live one way and they say, they say something else. You know, they, they live different from what they, they say. So it talks about envy as well. They envy because they can't see why they shouldn't envy. I don't see the the kind the peculiarness of who they are 
you know, as regards, you know, the Bible says whoever compare when we're comparing ourselves with ourselves, the Bible calls it foolishness. So it they they have they, they speak evil of others. Some people they have this ministry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a ministry of gisting about others behind their backs. Even someone that you have never spoken to about a particular issue. Just because everybody is saying something about that person, you say, yeah, it's, it's like this, it's like that, it's like, you know. So gossips, backbiting, you know, running down others when you don't really know what the actual, you know, issue is then it should not be something that should be found among us. That Bible calls that sign of infancy. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, Amen. but in understanding be men. Praise God. So God is, God is saying that we should... Be, we should be children in some of these things. A child cannot keep malice. That that's a good. Those are some of their good traits. You do something to them, they will they will still come and hold your leg and hug you. But that that is that is what that those are the kind of childish, the childlike, not childish. There's a difference between the two. Childlike faith that God wants us to have. Ch ch childlike traits. But not childish. Childish is is annoying. It's it's not it's not something that is desirable at all. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So they are born again, but their tongue, tongues are not born again. <laughs> so <laughs> praise God. You know some people that you will, you will know that this person ah are you sure this sister is saved? Praise the Lord. Proverbs thirteen verse three. Let's read that. Yeah, Proverbs 13 verse 3 says, He that keepeth his mouth, keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his lip shall have destruction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Praise God. Can you explain that to us? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, I, I, and I think a lot of times our mouth, actually, because the Bible says from the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Mm -hmm. So it, it, when we speak, it is what is in our heart that we bring out. And a lot of times they cause destruction because it, you know, you, you've gisted, gisted, you get home and you're reflecting towards the day and like, ah, why did I say all these things that I've said? And the Bible has said that in the, in the, in the multitude of words, there will be a problem. So, so as Christians, we, we should, our, our conversations and like what the Bible has said, our conversations should be heavenly. They should not, of, they should not be of this art. And that brings safety because it, a lot of, lives will have been saved by just refraining from saying some things. Mm -hmm. But when we say some things, and even as families and couples and all that, it is words that destroys everything. Exactly. If you don't talk, <laughs> words they're going to report to the pastor, he's not speaking, no. But when you say something, and then the other person will react, and that chain just starts, and there's just that problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. So I'll read from... Um, I'll read James 1 from verse 21, actually, from verse 21. Uh, actually, from verse 19. The Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. So some of us are very quick to wrath. And the Bible is, God is condemning that now. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We'll talk about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is just being the hearer, and not the doer of what we hear. It says that that's a you are deceiving yourself. You are not deceiving anybody else at that point in time. The Bible says... Um, so I'll just jump to verse 26. It says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and breedleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religious, religion is vain. So if he cannot bridle your tongue, then that religion is vain. At the same first James chapter 3, from in fact, when those of us that can please read the whole of chapter 3, 
it's uh, it talks about the tongue. It's talking more about the tongue. But verse two is where I want to zero in. It says, "If any man, it, for in many things we offend all." So all of us offend in so many things. If any man does not offend in word, that person is a perfect man. Another version says that person is a mature person. That person has grown, you know, past the particular stage. And they also can be able to control the whole body. So the reason why, so from this scripture, I say that the reason we're not able to control some of our passions is because of the things that come out of our mouth. Praise the Lord. So may God help us to be able to control our mouth. And in controlling the mouth means like our brother, you know, we share that scripture that out of the abundance of the heart, that means the heart must have had some work done. The Holy Spirit must have actually done some work in the heart for, for, for whatever comes out to be good and godly. Praise the Lord. The Bible says the words that we speak should edify the hearers. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, 1 Peter 3.10. First Peter 10. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Mm. Praise God. You can see from the scripture that this is just, um, you know how there's, um, there's something they call a leaking. <laughs> this just leaks our maturity. It leaks the grace of God the, from the mouth. Uh, things that God has been preserving and doing in our lives can actually be leaked off. And I pray that from today we'll begin to watch it in Jesus' name. The Lord will help us. So these people, they create and they enjoy division of factions in the body of Christ. Hmm. Jude one nineteen. So as we are speaking, we want you to just look at the kind of conversations you have with people. <laughs> And see what the you know end result is. If if it's not binding the body together, if it's not helping the body to grow, the body of Christ, I mean, then you know that we, you, might, you might be in this category. Praise the Lord. So Jude nineteen, Jude, Jude verse nineteen. Yeah, Jude nineteen says, "This be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit." They don't have the spirit. Okay. Romans sixteen seventeen. Romans sixteen seventeen. Mm. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have heard learned, and avoid them. Mm. What does the word Bible say we should do to them? Avoid <laughs> mark them. <laughs> so if someone has come to you with one story or the other in the past, first time, second time, the Bible says mark them and do what? Avoid them. Because the thing is, they will drag you down with them. I pray that that will not be a portion in Jesus' name. So let's mark those people. There are some people, there are some places we gather. You know, there are some areas where you, there are some gatherings. You know, very toxic. So that it's all one, you know, the Bible, no, not the Bible. I think, that, I think someone said, there's a quote from someone that says, great minds discuss, discuss ideas. Small mind discuss people. When all your gathering is about this person, what they are doing and what they are not doing, then you know that you are just reducing, you know, yourself. I pray that God will help us in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. So these people, they find it difficult to imbibe do sound doctrines. They tell you, oh, it's too much. This, this is too, you know, they are the truth. They are the grace without truth kind of Christian. You know, oh, grace of God has covered it. Do we have anything online? Nothing? Nobody is? <laughs> okay. The last comment was, we should be careful how we speak our mind because it may not align with the word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So thank you for that. So um, they find it difficult to imbibe sound doctrines. They have to, Ephesians 4.14. Ephesians 4.14. Ephesians 4.14. It says that we 
henceforth be not more be be no more children, mm. tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, mm. by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. You know the 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 thing about the about children is that they don't they don't know what they don't know the direction they don't know what to do so they're easily if someone says hey because <laughs> I remember um, my son when we in Nigeria his his um his teacher cannot speak English grammar correctly to save her life right she was the grammar aspect was. So, so and you will now be speaking the way the teacher speaks. I say no, this is not. This is it's all not. But my teacher said, you know. So they don't it, because he's a child. He could not decide. He could not know that uh, grammar. There's there has to be agreement between the subject and the thesis. <laughs> there was nothing like that. But the teacher would just do, say anything. So they don't know. They don't really know because they are children. But when if imagine now an English graduate <laughs> now speaking like that, you know that there is there is this trouble somewhere, isn't it? It's either they didn't stay in school, <laughs> or somebody wrote the exams for them, or something something is wrong, right? So um, we we need to be careful that we grow up, you know, we we imbibe sound doctrines, sound doctrines. Do you want to say something? Yeah, to praise that? the Lord. Yeah. You know, from um, the Bible, when Paul was Paul said something, he said, the doctrine of righteousness, that is the basics. So as Christians, and he said we should quickly master that so that we can move into deeper things. So as Christians, we cannot just stay there. Where today we fall to the same, to we just keep falling in the same, in in the same mode and all that. So and after this this doctrine of righteousness, then the meat comes. And that's where people would, because, you know, if they say, oh, if you want to get married, come and meet pastor, you are arguing about that. You understand? Doctrine does not mean scriptures. It means the application of scriptures. You understand? So here he's saying that there might be some things that you will be, you, you will be led as in, like, and doctrine is always passed from the leadership. It's not just you coming up with doctrine yourself. So when they are passed down to you, are you able to? Because you know the story, the story that was coming to my mind was Demas. In Colossians, uh, Paul was ailing Demas, saying greetings from these, these Demas and all that. When they got to Timothy, he had run away because something happened. And he said, I can't go on with you people. This thing is too hard for me. So as Christians, we should quickly and be able to take when there are some things that would he might not even say, ah, Pastor, this thing, I don't understand this thing, but we will go. Just because you have said it, we will go. And the Lord honors that. So as Christians, we should quickly mature to that point where the people that God has, has placed upon us, when the doctrines come, is not a form of argument that, oh, our generation does not like this and all that. But let us, it shows that you are matured. That means it's not the way you feel and just your way. And the way I want to do things, but you look at the way. Okay, this is this is what has been passed down. You understand? Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, just putting everything in line of the scriptures. You don't. We don't have to be. You know, just change everything and say I don't want to. It's actually a sign of maturity that we cannot receive instructions. It's a sign of immaturity, right? It, that you can't get instructions then. You won't, that means you won't be able to get a job. <laughs> you won't be able to, you can get the job, but you won't be able to keep the job if you cannot, you know, get, you receive instructions. I pray God will help us in Jesus' name. I've just run down through a few of the other things that I wrote down. So if the Bible has become boring to you, or maybe it's, it's boring, teaching of the scriptures is boring to you, then there's tendency that, you know, you are not really alive that much in Christ. You are not really, in fact, because it's only the word of God that would actually bring that that um, strength. And, you know, we should be excited when we hear that the word of God is going to be preached. If you think that um, if some, some people abuse the grace of God, oh, I'm a Christian, then it's fine. And I can, I'm free to do whatever. That is the sign of a baby in Christ. A child is the one that wants to wake up at 1 a.m. 
and sleep at 10 a.m. <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> and you just have to oblige them, isn't it? When they are still babies. But when they get to a point, you tell them you, whether you feel like sleeping or not, bed, you know. And at some point, you make, them, make sure that they wake up. So we cannot abuse the grace of God. And their life is not based on the word of God, but on, on, on happenings around them. You know, um, Paul's grace... And, you know, when they talk about grace, they, with the, the next point says they are, they're not able to endure, you know, hardship. When we hear Paul, when he talked about grace of God, grace of God, that grace made him suffer <laughs> more than anybody else. So <laughs> grace is there. So when, when this world and, and if, if our lives are about, oh, God is not good to me because I'm suffering in certain areas. That is the sign of being a baby in Christ. Like infants that were not growing because that, those things were meant to, is, were, is, they're meant to help us to grow. All those things, those are the meat that God is throwing your way. And say, take this meat, take this meat, and you're refusing. You know, and a child that does not eat meat, protein, or whatever they need to grow, they won't have, they'll be very feeble. Their muscles will not develop the way God wants. So to develop our muscles, we need to, the grace of God is there in times of trouble. It's to be able to help us to persevere. You know, some people will say, I'm not getting fed in that place. So they, they, it's a child that gets fed, right? It's, it's when you're a baby that you put a spoon in their mouth and you f force them to swallow it. But when your children are growing, all you need to do is cook the food, they get the food. So if you are waiting for somebody to feed you, like our brother say, saying that someone has to follow you up, someone has to push you to do your devotion, someone has to do that, then you know that you're actually not growing. It were 10 years and you're still wearing diapers. May God help us in Jesus' name. So, you, the, it, so when you say, oh, I'm not getting fed, Adults feel themselves. The food is there. It's, it's, it's cooked. It's, it's already just go there. It's just like me now telling my boys, <laughs> I finish cooking and I now drag them to the table one by one. I say, begin to eat. It's not going to, except they are sick. <laughs> so that's a sign of a sick Christian. So may God help us in Jesus' name. So we're supposed to get that food ourselves. It's already made available. Go get it every morning, eat it, digest it, make sure that it's, it's doing something in your body. Do Use that food to work out. My, my son, the, my, my second son, he would, he would eat his proteins, a lot of, and he will go and work out and work out until the muscles that you'll be telling your mommy, are you seeing something? I say, okay, I'm seeing something. Praise the Lord. It's, it's to develop the muscles. Amen. So, like we said, they, they, are not, they are unaware of false teachings, false doctrines, because children are easily deceived. You can give them candy and take them away from where they're supposed to be. They're easily deceived. Don't let us, you know, a lot of people follow these celebrity pastors. You know, they are celebrities. They, they know. So we, we want to, we have the names. We know, especially in our gen this generation, we have the names of those people that we follow. I pray that God will, Jesus will be larger than life, even to us in Jesus' name. So your happiness, if your happiness de depends on the kind of day you are having, then <laughs> if your joy depends on what is happening around you, then we know that you are kind of question. If you are constantly thinking and saying people are judging you, if you are not judged, you know, in fact, let's, let's actually read First Corinthians 5, 12 to 13. 1 Corinthians 5, 12 to 13, because that's, that's, that's one line that, you know, infant Christians say all the time. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 12, it says, For what have I to do to judge? Them also that are without, do, ye, do not ye judge them that are within. But them that are without, God judges. Therefore put away from amongst yourselves the wicked person. Praise the Lord. Because we're a body. If, if you see me doing something wrong and you don't tell me, 
you don't really love me and you don't love the body. Because we're, we're, we're one part, we're different parts of a whole. So if something is wrong with me and you don't point it out, then there's there's the problem. It's going to it's going to affect other people, and it's going to affect me and myself. So that's why we we call out things. So when your life is about oh they are judging me, they are doing this and all that, then you just just look at the word of God. What does what are they judging me based on? Is it the word of God? I I want you to judge me based on the word of God and and call me out if I'm not doing anything right. Praise the Lord. That is the way it should be. Um, we're talking about, you know, like the young ones were asking about how do, how how do this gen how does this generation, you know, just um imbibe these these deep things of God without losing their, you know, their youth, you know, <laughs> their youngness. The thing about it is, like we shared on Friday, God does not have his, you know, like it, it, there's no, how would I put it? No generation, you, do, you, can't, you can't excuse anything based on your generation. Because God already separated you to be a separate generation. The Bible says you're a chosen generation. I cannot do what baby boomers do. You know the, the statistics out there. Oh, this uh, these are this is what the baby boomers do. This is what they do. If I do that, then I've actually I'm not called out. The Bible says we should be called out from among them. Bible God talks about the you know God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were in different generations, but they fulfilled the will of God. They followed God. That God was able to call the will be called their God in um. I think it's um, Psalms 46. Is it Psalms 46? 24, Psalm 24 verse 6. The Bible says this is the generation of them that seek your face. We should be that generation. We should come out from all these things that we know, you know are, are making us not to fulfill the will of God for our lives. And I pray that the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Do you have any? Yeah, okay, just, you have um, a, a question and two comments. It says, is it okay to question some doctrines if it is not based on scripture but a personal encounter? Yes. And then yeah. um, two, two um, statements here saying, heeding to instructions are important and going back to the word of God to confirm those instructions are also important. Then our first source should be the word. It should, it should not just be... Um, Stayed on a shallow or surface level, but in uh, sorry, he said it should not just be studied on a shallow or surface level, but in depth, where we know the word and live by the word. Amen. Praise God. I will say that before uh, Tayo, you know the the, the Berean Christians, the everything you hear that people say is the word. You still need to go back and check it out. Is this true? It was Paul that was preaching. And these people will go back. Some of us, once we hear, oh, is Daddy Gio? Is um, this my celebrity pastor? We don't really check it out again because we feel that, okay, they have. Because the thing is, how we are hearing might even be different from what they are saying even. So that's why we let the Holy Spirit interpret every word to us. Praise the Lord. So the other side, you yeah. can. And, and another, um, if we look at it from nature, because nature is from God. My child, if I say it's this, cannot be questioning me and say, okay, tell me the calories, tell me the... They don't, they don't, so there's a level where you have to depend a largely to your to the people, the fathers that brought you into into the faith. It is because the thing is when we say, oh, it is after you are matured that you can say that, okay, I want to go and search out. Do you even know where to search out? Do we get what we're saying? And like we've said, children are hundred percent dependent on their parents. And that was why Christ was saying that anyone that makes this little one to fall, that this Terrible things should happen to them. Because he knows that when you are a child, that dependence is, is, is important. So if as a, as a little Christian, you, you are questioning, they say, do this. You are saying, give me the scriptures, give me the scriptures. Yes, it's good to, to do that. 
But don't come from a point of, okay, you know, I, I'm not even sure you're giving me the truth. Yeah, but when, when we come of age, after a time, you can decide I don't want to eat meat. If my child is grown and doesn't want to yeah. eat meat, that's, that's your choice. But you can't tell me at age two or age three that yeah, you want yeah, to. Vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, I just want to. The question <laughs> about the doctrine. Um, yeah, so the, the concerning the doctrine, yes, it's good to question every, everything you hear. It's actually good to question it. But um, in the, like our brother said the other time, doctrines are not necessarily the word. They, but they are. They might be from. They are largely from principles of the word. So the way we apply principles differ sometimes to to particular context, right? So if they're saying, for example, the one that you, the one he brought up, oh, um, if you want to, if you know that you've found someone you want to marry, and you want, to, then please go and talk to somebody that. Of course, you have it. You can. You are an adult. You can carry the girl. Go to <laughs> go to registry. Do you, you, the people? You don't even need to know. You, you don't even need to go there with people you know. You can rent witnesses, right? Rent them, pay pay them, and do whatever you need to do. But if you want to do, and there is nowhere in the scripture that says, "Oh, if you find somebody." Take them, to, but the principle is that some people have gone ahead, some people are watching over you, and which is what the word of God is. Some people are, are, are would, would answer to God on your behalf, what, what they've done with you. So, if you feel that okay, these are the people that I can submit to in that, in that respect, then you would, you would go ahead and do what the, as long as it's not outside the word of God. As long as what they have said is not, if they are not saying, oh, go and do this. You know, like in, in Redeem, for example, before you marry, you have to do HIV tests, right? You have to do all those things. There is, that, that one is not in scriptures, <laughs> but it's to protect. And so you can't say, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, go and marry. Nobody is good. In fact, pastor will celebrate you. You finish your marriage, you come. It would say, you know, you are still regarded as married. That's just an example. Praise the Lord. So we can question and ask why we're doing this. You know, not, not you know, there's questioning and there's questioning, right? Questioning in rebellion and say, you know, I'm not doing it. One of my sons, the other day, he went out, didn't tell anybody, and I was worried. I said, what? So I called him, what's happening? He said, oh, I'm so, so, so age. He's telling me how old he is. So I said, yeah, I gave birth to you, <laughs> so, so I know how old you are. But the thing is, it's actually a sign of maturity to be accountable. Is that, that, that is, is responsibility to be accountable, to say, okay, I'm going somewhere, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Nobody will say, don't go. Nobody will say, well, will just, the only thing as a mother will say, hey, be careful, you know, they know I will put my own jives there, I will put it there. But, you know, but I can't say, don't go out, don't go, because I know you are, you are of age and I trust you. Do you understand? But you not telling me is actually a, it, it's a sign of immaturity. Praise the Lord. God will help us in Jesus' name. So, anything else you want to add before we pray? I think just also commenting on that is that when we say we're a church and we fellowship together, it's the same way in your own, we all belong to families. And in each family, when you say you're part of the family, it's not just the, you don't just obey the natural law that says the father takes care of the child. But in your own house, there are laws and creeds that in one person's house, the, in my house, they can say, hey, you, every Saturday is sanitation day. We clean the house, we clean outside the house. Every other family in that, in that area might not be doing that. But for my own house, I adhere to those rules and regulations. So when you say you are part of a church, you say you are part of a family. And in the family structure, there are some things that are not just, it's not just the word of God, but there are certain things that are trainings. There are certain things that are laws, and they say this is how we do our thing. It's not sinful. They are not sinful things, but this is the way we conduct ourselves so that we can walk in unity. And part of you joining a family is that you accept their rules and their regulations. God himself said to these people of Israel, if foreigners come into your land, 
if they don't accept your laws, if they don't do this, don't do that, they cannot dwell with you. But if they do this, if they obey your laws and customs, let them dwell with you in peace. So I think that, that those are some of the things that you would have to accept. And then if it's in the scriptures, definitely it is always good to check your script, your Bible. If you find something off, you come to ask. Awesome. But, but what we are looking at today is so much more that you have been a Christian for five years. You have been exposed to so much light. And five years later, you are coming to ask, can I still, why can't I live with my boyfriend? Uh. Why can't I dress this dress that shows all my body? At 20, when you ought to be a teacher, you are still asking questions that a newborn, baby, someone that just came to Christ today, those are the things we start telling them you cannot do. Ten years, the Bible says that that person, God is not happy with you. Mm. It's, it is wrong. It is, it is contrary to the body of Christ for you to be that, that, you know, that, that part of the body. Your whole body is growing, but that finger has, is still a baby finger. It is not normal. You know? So it's one thing to ask questions, and we encourage asking questions, but you should be growing. You're, you shouldn't be coming to ask basic... 20 years in the ministry, you're asking me, why can't a gay... It's been a gay. You know what, what is wrong? Are we, you wrong know, and you are... You, you know, I've, and this thing we're talking about, and one mommy said one thing at the beginning, that it's not by your title in the church. Or age. You, or your age or anything. You can be the head of a home. You can be 90, 60, 80 years old and still be a carnal Christian. You can be the twelve. Years. So it's not your age. It's not your experience. It's not how you can. You, it's not the department you belong to, but your life. You are, like our brother said, you how have you applied God's word into your life? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's um, let's pray. And one thing also before I just have to say before we go on is pride, is a sign of infancy. Pride. Nobody can tell me what to do. You know, we might not see it as pride, but that's the way God sees it. Um, I can I have my own life to live and all that. Then, yeah, live it, and God will help you. Praise the Lord. Let's bow down heads and pray. Brother Bra Tyron, please just. In Jesus' up. name. Amen. Father Lord, we thank you for another great session again. We thank you, Lord, for the speakers. We thank you, Lord, for the hearers. We thank you, Lord, for your utterance that has come forth, O oh Lord, even to talk about the life of a carnal Christian and why we should not be this way. Father, Lord, we ask that even as your word has gone forth, let it shed light in the heart of every hearer as to what their states are with you in the name of Jesus. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will reveal to each and every one of us how you see us, how our conducts have been recorded in heaven, how God perceives our thoughts, our deeds. And Father, Lord, if there be any among us who is carnal, we ask, O oh Lord, that in your great mercy, you will touch us again a second time in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, we don't want to be hearers alone. We don't want to be hypocrites. We don't want the people who we hear your word, but in practice, we deny you. Father, we ask that you do not be the testimony of any one of us in the name of Jesus. As your word has gone forth, let it bring forth the fruit of righteousness. Let it bring forth the fruit of repentance. Let it bring us that, bring that transformation, that change, that becoming of those who are called the children of God in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for everybody that has heard. We ask that through this one, so Lord, that their family will be changed. Their neighbors, everyone around them, Father Lord, that are carnal, that through these lives I have heard your word, you will use them, O oh Lord, and create a great harvest even unto your kingdom in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the teachers that have spoken. We ask, O oh Lord, that even as they have spoken, Father Lord, that you will remember each and every one of them for good in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the hearers that you have brought. We ask, O oh Lord, that even as they stay true to the rest of the service, let your presence abide with them in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the great thing you have done in our midst today. Blessed be thy name forever. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the living Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, I just want us to uh, ground ourselves in the presence of God. I want us to just get into the attitude of worship. Um, let's remind our hearts that God is our corner. He's our cornerstone. He's our help. He's our friend. He's our peace. Thank you, Jesus, because we know that we can rest in you. Your word says that you are able to keep us from stumbling. You're able to keep us from falling, even until the end. We thank you, Lord, because we have this assurance in you. So we'll sing, my hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
just sing of how awesome our God is and how much we love the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen.
there is power in the name of Jesus. So much power in your name. There is power in the name of Jesus. So much power in your name. Sing, there is power. nothing else compares to your holy name. Nothing else compares to the majesty of your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so now we will declare that every name, everything that seeks to exalt itself against the knowledge of Jesus is cast down, is cast down. We declare that you have no place here. The only name we will exalt is the name of Jesus.
Break our walls down. 
Jesus, you're the name I'm lifting high, your glory, shaking up the earth and skies, revival, we want to see your kingdom heal, oh God. Father in heaven, we ask, O oh Lord, that you will answer and hear the desires of our heart. That, Lord, you will just release your spirit over us afresh. Release your spirit over the world afresh. Release your spirit over your church afresh. In the name of Jesus, we ask, O oh Lord, that your spirit will break out, will burst forth from, forth from within us in the name of Jesus. That, Lord, in your name we will conquer, in your name we will pull down, in your name we will rise up and erect, in the name of Jesus. We ask, O oh Lord, that as we continue in the service, that, Lord, you will continue with us, that you will cause your face to shine upon us and never, ever leave us, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for in Jesus' name we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen and amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church again. And um, can you please welcome your neighbor, wherever you are in your home, in your living room, in your bedroom. Say, neighbor, good morning. Welcome to service. We give God the praise. The Bible says, blessed be the Lord. And this is the day the Lord has made will rejoice and be glad in it. It's a day of joy. Hallelujah. Glory be to God in the highest. Another day of victory. And um, 
we bless God who has given us life and opportunity to be alive again. Hallelujah. Let us praise the name of our God and give gratitude with a heart of gratitude. We thank God for that time of praise and worship. God bless the choir. Uh, we thank God for our Sunday school teachers who taught us very well this morning. We pray that the word of the Lord will bring forth fruits in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. May I welcome all our online viewers. God bless you wherever you're watching from, on YouTube, on Facebook, on all our platforms. God bless you in Jesus' name and all our Grace Chapel family. Can I have some fires online right now? Hallelujah. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost uh, burn. And let the Spirit of the Lord that has already come down continue to walk in and through our lives in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. All right, let's take our offering right now uh, before we go into the word of the Lord this morning to hear what the Lord is saying to us. And as we take the offering, um, let me take a few announcements while the offering is on. Hallelujah. So happening this week in Grace Chapel, we're entering the Easter week. Amen. Uh, our nightly prayer meeting continues at 7 p.m. Uh, via Zoom. Um, it's getting, you know, the prayers are, are getting uh, stronger and hotter. And we bless God for the turnout. Um, the Digging the Bible Studies this Wednesday um, via YouTube, Facebook channel, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. And then uh, we have our Good Friday service. It's a, it's a whole day retreat. And there's a retreat that uh, you can't afford to miss, young and old. Please let us be part of this retreat uh, with our brother, Brad Biliakoni. And uh, the, the, the theme is the cross of Christ. And you don't want to miss that one-day retreat. I assure you, your life will never remain the same again. Hallelujah. So on Sunday, the Easter Sunday, hallelujah, um, God is going to be speaking to us again. And um, we are going to be blessed. In the name of Jesus Christ um, of Nazareth. Amen. So please, uh, the children um, continue to meet on Zoom Saturdays and Sundays. 4 p.m. today, the children will meet. And then the Teens Church, the Grace Life uh, Teens Church, 1 p.m. Uh, via Zoom today. And all our brethren uh, uh, who are celebrating their birthday and wedding anniversary this week, we wish uh, we, we wish you well in Jesus' name. God's richest blessing as you celebrate another year in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, the believers class for the main church are ongoing via Zoom. Please, you can still register with pastors, uh, Bemi or my wife, uh, Sister Biola or Sister Dio for the teens and um, believers classes. The workers in training also continues at 5 p.m. Uh, today. And please, again, the tax receipts available, now available, you can either pick up a copy at the admin office Tuesday to Friday or request a copy via email. Please send your request via email uh, to admin at rccgbc.org. Uh, uh, Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, there's a new health order from Dr. Bonnie Henry. Uh, for those of us who have been following, Based on the order, we can only accommodate 21 persons. All right, in person, 21 in total in the sanctuary. So therefore, we'll be opening uh, registration on our website this Thursday at 8 p.m. Okay, uh, for next week's Sunday service. We're having in-person service, but we can only accommodate 21 people in our sanctuary. So you'll be required to complete a self-health check online uh, before uh, registering. Praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So that's all the, the announcement for now. And uh, more will come uh, probably later. Amen. Let's pray over the offering and the tithe. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you once again for the opportunity to give. Lord, we want to appreciate you. There's nothing a man has that he does not receive from above. And how much out of much you've given to us, we are giving back to you, back to your work. Please, Father, help us to continue to be faithful stewards of your inheritance in Jesus' name. Continue to bless your church in Jesus' name. Let your church not lack anything good in Jesus' name. And Father, let these uh, resources be used judicially, the wisdom to apply it uh, in Jesus' name. Please 
We ask, oh God, that lives will be transformed, souls will be saved, our communities will be blessed. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the people will say, Amen and Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right. Let's quickly go into the word of God this morning. What is God saying to us this um, uh, Sunday uh, before the Easter Sunday? Hallelujah. Now, uh, I want to be speaking to us this morning um, on the topic, what the cross meant to Christ. What the cross meant to Christ. Now, it is impossible to take the cross out of Christianity, very, very impossible, and still retain true Christianity. So we cannot take the cross out of our Christian lives and live as genuine Christians. The cross is, um, is important to Christianity. So our text this morning, I want to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. The Bible says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Father, please bless your word. Anoint your word. Holy Spirit, let your word come to us with clear understanding. Let it transform our lives, build our faith, and let your name alone be glorified. Thank you, our Father. In Jesus' precious name, we are prayed. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 is our text this morning. The New Living Translation says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Hallelujah. The Living Bible says, For God took the sinless Christ and poured into him our sins. Then in exchange... He poured God's goodness into us. Now, this is one of, the most, um, one of the most magnificent vice verses in the Bible. You know, the, I read somewhere, the man of God, Charles Spurgeon, calls this verse of scripture the heart of the gospel. It is the gospel in one verse. The entire gospel in one verse. So everything you need to know about how to go to heaven, you know, and, uh, can be found in this one verse of scripture. So in this Sunday, leading, to, leading up to Easter, uh, we are looking at the cross. And we are going to be looking at the cross from five perspectives. Number one, what it, what it meant to God, what the cross meant to Christ and to Satan, and what it means to the world and to the church. That's what I'm going to be looking at um, today, um, I think on Wednesday as well, as we prepare to go into Easter. My earnest prayer is that you'll be strengthened and as we return to the heart of our faith, the heart of our faith in Jesus' name. Now, how important is this verse? That's the first question we want to answer. This verse of Scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be seen for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So, um, if you get this scripture right, you can be wrong in a lot of other places and still make it to heaven. Each time I look at these scriptures, the deeper I look at it, the better understanding I have by the Holy Spirit. Now, in, the, in these days of, you know, there is so much theological confusion, it is important that the church of Christ be firmly rooted, settled on the gospel, the gospel message. That is, after all, you see, that is the only thing we are called to do. Our only message, God has not committed us, you know, uh, committed to us a message about, you know, uh, political power or military might. We are not called to right all the wrongs in the world or to pass judgment on every passing trend like the church of God is doing today. The church has been given one major task. And what is that task? To preach the gospel to every person on earth. That's our calling. To preach the gospel to every nation. Mark chapter 16, 
verse 15. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into the world, preach the gospel. That's our calling. Hallelujah. Now, if that is our God-given task, if that is our God-given assignment, then it, it behoves us to make sure we know what the gospel is. What is the gospel? That's the first thing I would like us to address this morning briefly before we go deeper into the message. What is the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. This is Paul speaking. I'm going to re read, read him from verse number 1. Paul said, now let me remind you, brothers, of what the gospel really is. For it has not changed. It is the same good news I preached to you before. You welcome it then and it still, and still do now. For your faith is squarely built upon this wonderful message. Hallelujah. Now verse 2 says, and it is this good news that saves you if you still firmly believe it. Unless, of course, you never really believed it in the first place. Verse 3. I passed on to you right from the first what had been told to me. And what is that? That Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture says, he would. That's the gospel. Hallelujah. And then verse 4 says, and that he was buried. And that three days afterwards, he arose from the grave, just as the prophet foretold. That's the gospel. Amen. He was seen by Peter and later by the rest of the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 Christians, brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died by now. Hallelujah. That's the gospel. So in this passage, Paul emphasizes the, 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 the supremacy of the gospel. It is of first importance. The gospel message contains two facts, two historical facts. It is of first importance. Amen. Two, is, two historical facts, both supported by the scripture. Please follow me carefully. Christ's death and his resurrection. The death of Christ and his resurrection. Bo both those facts are, you know, are, are, they have proofs. Christ's Death is proved by his burial, and his resurrection is proved by the high witnesses. Please follow me carefully. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.21, which is our text message, says, God made him who had no sin to be seen for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, this text this morning tells us what the cross meant to Christ, what the cross meant to Christ. And each phrase tells us of a miracle. Now, this miracle that cannot be fully explained, but must be accepted by faith. It's by faith. Let's begin by considering the character of the one who was crucified, the character of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, his character. The Bible says he had no sin. God made him who had no sin. Who had no sin. Now, that's serious. When we trust in Christ, there's an exchange. Hallelujah. He takes our sin and then makes us right with God. So our sin was laid on Christ at his crucifixion. His righteousness is given to us at our own conversion. There's an exchange. This is what Christians call, we call it Christ's atonement for sin. Now, in the world economy... There's what they call trade by batter, right? Or battering works only when, when two people exchange goods of relatively equal value. Exchange of goods of equal value. But God offers to trade his righteousness for our sin. Something of um, immeasurable worth for something completely worthless. Beloved, how grateful we should be for his kindness for us. I don't know about you, I'm grateful for God's kindness for this trait. God made him who had no sin to be seen for us. And Paul begins with the fact that Christ had no sin. 
Now, some version says that he knew no sin. And that stresses the sinless nature of his inner being. There was no sin outwardly because there was no sin inwardly. When Jesus Christ walked on earth, he was perfectly righteous. Jesus was righteous. I mean, he, he was without fault. He was without sin. He was without evil. He never did anything wrong. He never broke any laws of God. Hallelujah. And never deviated in the slightest degree from the path of God's will. That's Jesus Christ we are talking about. This is crucial because if Christ had sinned, he could not be our Savior. Amen. Let me say that again. If Christ had sinned, there's no way he could have been our Savior. A sinner could not pay for the sins of another sinner. It is not possible. Amen. The sacrifice must be made by one who was without spot or blemish. Like the lambs, you know, the lambs slain on the night of the final plague in Egypt in Exodus chapter 12. So God ordained that the lambs must be one year old male, in good health, free from disease, and physical defects. So the lambs that were slaughtered in Egypt picture the coming of the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Who by his bloody sacrificial death will take away the sin of the entire world. Glory be to Jesus. John chapter 1 verse 29. In John chapter 1 verse 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming into, unto him. What did John say? He saith, behold the Lamb of God. We take away the, way the sin of the world. Glory be to God. Now remember in Exodus chapter 29, if we read from verse 38 to 42, every morning and evening a lamb was sacrificed in the temple for the sins of the people. Let me read that to us in the New Living Translation. Exodus 29, verse 38. Now, these are the sacrifices you are to offer regularly on the altar. Each day, offer two lambs that are a year old. One in the morning and the other in the evening. With one of them, offer two quart of choice flour mixed with one quart of pure oil or pressed olives. Also offer one quart of wine as a liquid offering. Verse 41. Offer the other lamb in the evening along with the same offerings of flour and wine as in the morning. It will be a pleasing aroma, a special gift to the Lord. These burnt offerings are to be made each day from generation to generation. Hallelujah. Offer them in the Lord's presence at the tabernacle entrance. There I will meet with you and speak with you. Glory be to Jesus. And this is in line with Isaiah prophecy. Isaiah uh, prophesied in Isaiah 53 verse 7. Isaiah 53 verse 7, the New Living Translation says, He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to be slaughtered. And as a sheep, he silent before the shearers. He did not open his mouth. The Messiah, that God's servant, will be led to be slaughtered like a lamb. So to pay the penalty for sin, a life has to be given. And God chose to provide the sacrifice himself. What the great things God did for us. I don't know about you, I'm so grateful. I am so glad I will forever be grateful to God. The sins of the world were removed when Jesus died as a perfect sacrifice. Amen. This is the way our sins are forgiven. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8 says, Purge out therefore the old living, that ye, may be, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unliving. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with all living, neither the living of malice and wickedness, like we learned earlier about somebody not maturing, but with the unliving bread of sincerity and truth. So, as the Hebrews prepared for their exodus from slavery in Egypt, they were commanded to prepare bread without yeast because they didn't have time to wait for it to rise. The yeast will rise. 
And because yeast also was a symbol of sin, they were commanded to sweep all of it out of the house. And the same instruction God is giving us today, the people of God. In Exodus chapter 15, chapter 12, rather verse 15, the Living Bible says the celebration shall last seven days. For that entire period, you are to eat only bread made without yeast. Anyone who disobeys this rule at any time during the seven days of the celebration shall be excommunicated from Israel. People of God, Christ is our Passover lamb. The perfect sacrifice for our sin. Because he has delivered us from slavery of sin. We should have nothing to do with the sins of the past, which is old bread. Hallelujah. The sin of the world means everyone's sin. The sin of each individual. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus paid the price of your sin by his death. He paid the price of my sin by his death. You can receive forgiveness by confessing your sin to him and asking for his forgiveness. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Lamb of God. Amen. So the question this morning as we go on is, how do we know that Christ had no sin? It's very important to answer this question. How do we know? Listen to the testimonies of his adversaries. John chapter 19 verse 4. This is interesting. The Bible says, Pilate, John 19 verse 4. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I have found no fault in him. No fault in him. Primarily from the testimony of his adversaries, when the Roman governor Pontius Pilate examined examine him, he declared, I find no fault in this man. Hallelujah. That's the testimony of his adversaries. Look, read Matthew chapter 26 again. Matthew 26 from verse 59. Now the chief priest and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put, to put him to death but find none. Hallelujah. Yet yeah, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. At the last came two false witnesses. When Herod and the Jewish elders put him on trial, they could find no high witnesses against him. So they rounded up false witnesses who lied on their oath. Wow. Hallelujah. Matthew 27. Let's look more. Matthew 27, 54. Now, when the centurion and they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly this was the Son of God. When Christ hung on the cross, the Roman centurion cried out, truly this was the Son of God. Hallelujah. So the question is, how do we know that Christ had no sin? Can I say that again? Christ had no sin. But how do we know? He knew all about sin, but he never sinned. Not even once. Christ did not sin, not even once. He lived, a, he lived in a sinful world like you and I, but the stain of sin never tarnished his character. The stain of his sin never tarnished his image. Of all the billions of people who had lived on planet Earth, he is the only one about whom it can be truly said that he never sinned in word, in thought, or in deed. That's the Christ we are talking about. There's no hint of moral contamination surrounding his name. Clean inside out. So how do we know that Christ had no sin? He faced temptation head on. Full strength, all that the devil could throw at him. But having felt its full weight, he never gave in. Jesus did not give in. Never even came close to sinning. That's Christ. He never confessed a fault because he had no fault to confess. Praise the name of the Lord. He never asked for pardon because he never needed one. In John chapter 8 verse 46. John 8 46. See, John, Jesus Christ says, Which of you convict me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? No, the CSB translation put it very well. Who among you can convict me of sin? If I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? He claimed that no one could convict him of sin. And he was right. And he's still right. That is why the writer of Hebrews could say that he was tempted at all points. As we are, yet he was without sin. Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest 
who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. We do not have, God does not have a son without temptation. He only has a son without sin, and that's the person of Jesus Christ. He was tempted at all points, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of our own need. Hallelujah. As I close at this point, we have said Jesus Christ, his character, he had no sin. Christ had no sin. Let me say that again. Let me say this about sin. You know, sin is like insects. You know, it was reported in the news recently that uh, a big pine tree in the mountains of Colorado had fallen victim to a pine beetle and died. Now, what's interesting about this tree is that, according to the local news, up to that point, the tree was thought to be indestructible. It had survived 14 lightning strikes. 14. And many years of Colorado winters, and those who live in Colorado knows what the winter is like in Colorado, including avalanches and fires, it survived it. But it was very eventually brought down from within by a tiny insect, pine beetle, that did its work silently and quietly. You know, I had a similar experience inside my house many years ago in Lagos, Nigeria. I had a very beautiful, well-decorated three-seaters in my living room. You know, the type we call full upholstery, beautiful. You know, if you are my generation. I will never forget that experience. For months, and possibly over a year, in the dead of the night, I hear tiny noise of insect like eating, biting at something. And the noise is more, especially at night, when it's all quiet. The noise, I, I even remember I had prayer vigil against demons. I would think these demons come only at night. Casting out demons out of my house. But the tiny noise continued until one day. I sat on the chair, the old chair went down. It went down. That's when I noticed that the beautiful chair on the outside is being eaten by insects that has been inside the bad wood used to make the beautiful chair. And the beautiful outside were rotting with insects inside over months and years. Thank God it was me that sat on it and not the children who were still very young then. Ladies and gentlemen, that's, w that's the way it is with sin in a person's life. Either a Christian or a non-Christian, sin kills silently. Sin destroys from inside silently. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is law. Ezekiel 18.4. Ezekiel 18.4 says, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, he shall die. Proverbs 4.23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Ladies and gentlemen, as we approach Easter, Christ paid it all. The cross of Christ has made provision for you and I. The Lord Jesus Christ has made the provision. Glory be to God. And Christ is calling us, come to the cross. That's the place to receive victory over sin. When you exchange your sin with the righteousness of God, God is pleased. Christ came and paid it all. That's what Christ came to do at the cross, at the cross. Cross, the cross of Christ. Is there anybody this morning that is here to answer the call. I want to stop here, and I will continue here on Wednesday. It became sin for us, Jesus Christ. What the cross meant to Christ, God made him who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
Jesus, the sinless son of God, became sin for you and I. That's a miracle. It's a miracle by faith. Will you come to the cross of Christ this morning, ladies and gentlemen? If you have never been to the cross, I want to make a call. Please come. Christ is waiting. Hallelujah. There's a power that flows from the cross of Christ. Will you bow your heart with me in this moment as we talk to the Lord in prayer? At the cross, Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. Glory be to Jesus. Some translation attempted to soften the, the blow by translating sin offering instead of sin, although that is acceptable. But Jesus Christ is made in the call again this morning. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heaven laden, and I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Glory be to Jesus in the highest. Can you just lift up your hands to the Lord and say, Father, thank you. Thank you for the atonement for this atonement for, for my sin. Lord, I celebrate Jesus. I thank you for the cross. Without the cross, we are nothing. Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. I wish I could sing that song, What the Cross Meant to Christ. It is impossible to take the cross out of Christianity and still retrain through Christianity. We cannot take the cross out of our Christian journey. Glory be to God in the highest. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for making Christ who had not sinned to be sin for us, so that in him we might have the righteousness of God. If you are here to give your life, if you are here to exchange your sin with the righteousness of God, I want to pray for you right now. Please make that choice. It's the best decision you can ever make in life. And as many of you are making that decision right now, I want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, just, just pray this simple prayer after me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I come to the cross of Christ this Sunday morning. And I've come to exchange my sin with the righteousness of God. Father, thank you for Christ who has taken my place. I celebrate God in my life. And I thank you, almighty God, for the atonement of my sin. And so, Lord, I follow Christ from today. And I continue to live daily for him and to live daily for Christ in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for every household that has accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, this season of Easter, you will never lose focus of the cross. The cross will continue to release its power upon your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you so much. I worship and adore you. Lift up your hands, people of God, and let's worship and celebrate him as I say this final prayer. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. I worship you, exalt you, magnify your holy name. At the cross, at the cross. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We worship you. So I bless all of you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As we go into this week, this week is a week of victory for you in Jesus' name. You will experience the victory of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, and every blessing of the cross come into your life and to your home in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak health and healing unto your life and to your home in Jesus' name. I speak victory of the cross in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And the Almighty God will come to fight your battle for you. Battle, physical battle, spiritual. The Lord of hosts will arise on your behalf. Thank you, my Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. I worship you, O God Almighty. Thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. And the people will say, Amen and Amen. God bless you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. See you later tonight at 7 p.m. in our prayer meeting and during the week. God bless you all. Let's rise up as we share the grace and fellowship. Glory be to God in the highest. Father, thank you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Grace and fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. And say, surely God's goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. And the people will say, Amen and Amen. Remember to preach the gospel in Jesus' name. This week is another opportunity. Please, let's take advantage of every opportunity to share the gospel with the lost souls. Hallelujah. God bless you. Have a great week in Jesus' name. Amen.
Acts Church. I thank you for watching me today, but I'm so, so excited about what God is going to do tonight. So you already know what to do as you come on in the room. Prepare the place for God to be. That means speak well. Open up your mouth and begin to speak well, even in here. Open up your mouth and begin to speak well of the Most High God, for He is good. Woo! And His mercy endureth forever. There is no one like Him. So we open up our mouths and we give you all the glory, for you are 